just because it's uh, going on six, uh, and I'm going to have to run out of here and put more time on my uh, meter in about 40 minutes, uh, if people can focus uh, their questions, that would be awesome. I know, important issue, but no rambling. Okay, please proceed, Commissioner Wilson. Thanks, I have a few questions. Do you want me to do all the questions okay, yeah. and then... And then, or do you want me to do them one by one? I'm sorry, say again? Do you want me to do the questions one by one, or do you just want me to lay them all out? I just have questions, really. Uh, well, why don't you lay them out? Okay. Uh, one of the questions has to do with um, the implementation of this ordinance outside the coastal zone, and if it's already been, and then, as has it already been applied, and have they seen, a, you know, like a migration of people uh, because of that. Um, yes, outside the coastal zone, it's been applied, but uh, Mr. Butler would probably be, be the, the person to tell you about how well it's been implemented. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson and uh, Chair Brownsey. Um, we have not implemented the um, midnight to 5 a.m. parking restrictions outside of the coastal zone um, at this time. Okay. We do have the safe parking implemented but stay, not. stay right where you are so i can ask staff so <laughs> staff uh, uh so um if if we deny this and that we still it would still be applicable outside the coastal zone correct that's correct it would not be applicable inside the coastal zone because they wouldn't have a coastal permit to implement the program but everything outside the coastal zone the city is free to do or continue to do so if, was there analysis and i didn't or i didn't see it if we deny this was was there any sort of analysis or if it's applied outside the coastal zone would it then impact the coastal zone in terms of because we would be allowing this to occur inside the coastal zone as opposed to outside the coastal zone? um i'm not sure there's a formal analysis i think it's clear practically speaking that there would be more people certain seeking um, potentially seeking oversized vehicle parking at night in the coastal zone if it was you know you couldn't park outside the coastal zone that's for sure okay so now back back to you guys the yes. for funding with relationships so my my town has a, a safe parking program it's the only one in the county just kind of like you like 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 you folks and it's and it's new um and i'm proud of my city for doing that and but at the same time it has some limitations in terms of a uh, sunset with relation to funding and then of course as you are probably familiar with trying to find the locations to do these things is really really hard and and they don't know if the owner of that property wants to continue with that past you know a certain date and so i i just want to what's the robustness of the of the program as you see it currently you know as moving forward how how secure do you feel both in the funding and the locations Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. Um, if the commission chooses to approve this permit, then we are committed to continuing the safe parking programs. Um, we have them implemented right now on city-owned facilities, um, or one, in one instance, a, a city-leased facility at the National Guard Armory. Um, but um, the challenge there is that um, those spaces in the downtown, for example, are used during the day by downtown businesses and so forth. And so as you mentioned, the locations are very challenging, um, but um, for the tier two with overnight only, then we can identify locations where their parking lots are underutilized in the evening times. And so we have a, a, a level of confidence that we will be able to both um, continue those. And if there are, there's one of them, for example, that we um, are looking at developing an affordable housing project on. We have other options where we can expand in um the uh expand the number of parking lots that we're providing okay so pivot back to staff if there's a if if there's a um it, it, it seems like this permit or the it sets a threshold in, in the current context if there's any measurable reduction in that service does that then does that then cre create or it, is there a rev revocation that occurs Uh, it's not structured explicitly that way currently no um it, it authorizes this program in its current configuration which is up to the 71 spots and the, the way in which the city's identified it for a year um okay 
but, but it also anticipates that the city's going to learn things and maybe they find additional spots. You know, I'm, I'm not quite sure how that, you know, part of this, and I think, you know, and you can ask Mr. Butler if he agrees with this assessment, part of this is this is this is an attempt to do something and it may not be perfect currently and they're going to learn as they go along. Mm-hmm. And thus, this is a, this is to to get that going. Um, okay. But no one, no one, nobody over here thinks it's the perfect program right now. Okay, I appreciate it. you've answered my questions. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Harmon. Uh, no, why don't you do it? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of comments. I'm going to try to be really brief because I know it's late. Um, First, one of the public commenters noted that um, we all have similar oversized vehicle ordinances in our communities, and um, I would acknowledge in the case of Santa Barbara, that's true. Um, I have always been against and uh, remain very, very uncomfortable with our oversized vehicle ordinance, and I would note that it has been the subject of significant ongoing and quite onerous litigation. Um, So while that may be true, it has not at all been simple in the city of Santa Barbara. Um, With that said, however, I also would acknowledge that these ordinances don't come about in a vacuum. There are very real quality of life issues that I think are implicated in the conversation that we're having. And it's a huge challenge for jurisdictions, particularly coastal communities, to try um, to balance that and and navigate a path forward for all residents in our community, including um, those who are houseless. So with all that said, I would say um, I'm I'm definitely struggling with this one, in particular in light of the advice that we received from our general counsel, how our economic or our environmental justice policy is used as an overlay. We're thinking about environmental justice as looking at the burdens and benefits of granting a CDP and whether those burdens would be disproportionately focused on one community. I I just simply can't say that the burdens are not disproportionately focused. They're essentially exclusively focused on one community and the benefits of this ordinance are almost exclusively granted to a community that um, is significantly more privileged and um, housed. So I'm I'm not quite sure that I'm seeing a path forward for supporting the CDP on those grounds, um, though I'm interested to hear from our colleagues whether that is sufficient grounds under the Coastal Act. I would say that's a question that I would have for my colleagues and colleagues and hope that they could um, draw that out for me a little bit. I also just want to say that I have um, a very difficult, poss- possibly maybe impossible time separating the issues with um, the parking of oversized vehicles with the condition or state of being unhoused. And to me, rules like this just fundamentally deny oversized vehicle dwellers and houseless folks with equal protection under the law. And I understand that's not our charge here today, um, but that is a very, very significant constitutional concern for me. And I think um, it's important that um, that that is understood to be part of this conversation, not an explicit one, but certainly uh, one that's running adjacent to what we're talking about uh, vis-a-vis the Coastal Act. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Harmon, Commissioner Cummings, then uh, Vice Chair Hart. I thought you said Commissioner. Oh, Commissioner Cummings. Thank you. I heard Harmon. I heard Harmon then. I heard Harmon Cummings' heart. So it, it, it just kind of underscores the lateness of the hour. <laughs> yeah. And I just like to ask the chair: Is this? I mean, since we've already heard public comment, is this an opportunity to question to provide questions and comments? Um, Let's. I, I'm trying to consolidate just to expedite. So if you could do questions and comments, um, thank you. Okay. So I just would like to ask, and maybe city staff could um, address this question. I know that um, from what I heard and what I've had in conversation with you all is that the Tier 3 program provides access for 20 vehicles. There's currently 14. Maybe there's been an update, um, but there's 50 vehicles on the wait list. And for that Tier 3 program, it costs about half a million dollars a year for to just run that one component of the program. I'm wondering if you could speak to the overall cost, because based on the recommendations by staff, 71 spaces are required for this program. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to um, where those other vehicles are anticipated to go, how much are those 
additional costs uh, because it seems like um, I just have concerns around the funding piece of this. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner Cummings. The um, the map in our presentation included the um, locations, and I know we went through that uh, pretty quickly, but um, we have identified um, the, uh, the 70 or so spaces, and they are uh, the tier two spaces are approximately $67,000 right now. And so when we've got 15 to 20 um, in tier three, costing 500,000. And uh, that's that's primarily because you know we've got intensive case management. We have four um, employees working full time. Um, and and so they're providing direct uh, services, but also, as I mentioned before, the, um, the um, locations uh, are, are really challenging for tier three um, and our ability to provide those. So tier two, we are um, providing the hand washing and um, trash and um, uh, restroom services at each of those, as well as um, servicing those on a regular basis. And that's about 67,000 a year. And how many of those are operational right now? Like how many spaces in total are operational? Um, right now we've got, um, we've got two sites that are um, uh, up and running. Um, uh, that is um, uh, the two sites that are up and running um, have, I believe, a, ca a capacity of uh, 10 or 12. Um, and um, I would, um, if, if you've got specific questions in terms of that 67,000, if that is for the um, the full operation or just the sites that we have right now, I would um, welcome my, my colleagues to speak on that if, if that's of interest to you. Sure. Um, Lisa or Larry, uh, Lisa is our deputy city manager and uh, Larry and Wally is our homelessness response manager who you heard from earlier. Um, they're on the Zoom. Is it possible to invite either of them to speak to more of the specifics? I guess I'm promoting yeah. Lisa. Is it Lisa Murphy? Yes. I'm promoting her in right now. Great. Thank you. And Larry is already in. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I'll I'll speak to that first. Uh, the sixty-seven thousand approximately uh, would not be uh, does not presently is budgeted to cover the entire of uh, forty-seven forty-eight of the state parking spaces. Um, again, as we multiply lots, um, there's additional cost, uh, but that cost is budgeted as beyond the two lots that we currently have activated. Got it. Um, the next question I have is related to what I understand is, and actually I should, I want to make sure that I um, preface my questions and my comments so that members of the commission um, are aware and that the public knows that for full disclosure, um, I was on the city council when this item came before us. Um, I did not support the ordinance when it came before the Santa Cruz city council, um, but in my new capacity, as a coastal commissioner, I'm evaluating this item under the lens of the Coastal Commission and the Coastal Act. So I just want to make sure that that's clear and that that's in alignment with, with what staff had recommended as we were beginning our deliberation on this item. Um, so uh, with that, I want to go back to um, questions for staff because um, one of the, and so when we're considering this under the Coastal Act, there's two main issues that we're trying to address. Coastal access, um, and environmental protection. And so my next question to you all is that my understanding, and this is definitely within the uh, city of Santa Cruz, and I imagine this is a law across the state of California, but vehicles that sit in one spot for more than 72 hours can be considered abandoned and towed. And um, I'm just wondering because I've heard that um, on multiple occasions, and we've heard this from the audience, that vehicles will be parked for weeks, months at a time, and um, and one could understand how this could lead to further environmental degradation if calls are being made saying, hey, there's black water being dumped and there's no enforcement. And so I'm just curious because I do know of a scenario where there was a fifth wheel that had been detached from a trailer or from a truck left in the coastal zone uh, behind uh, 
uh, what's now called Mission West. It's a bar called The Watering Hole. And the owner of that establishment had reached out to us numerous times and had reported that for five weeks, this trailer was sitting there and it was actively dumping gray and black water into the streets. And there was nothing, nothing had been done throughout the course of this time. So I'm just curious, without these laws even being on the books, what has the city been doing to ensure coastal protection and that we are, and that the city itself is actually enforcing the laws that protect our coastal environment? Okay. I'm going to be a really obnoxious chair. I'm just going to interrupt, not because I don't want him to answer and for you to ask every question that you want. There's just two of us who have to go feed our meters so that we can avoid um, tickets, uh, which we're not going to get reimbursed for. <laughs> so uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. And then so keep that question in mind. And then we're going to return at uh, like uh 612-ish. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Okay, um, Mr. Butler, are, are you, we're going to reconvene the California Coastal Commission. Uh, parking meters have been fed, and Mr. Butler, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Brownsey, and to address the uh, question of Commissioner Cummings, um, uh, there are a few things. Um, we do have capacity challenges with respect to enforcing the 72-hour rules, um, and it's also common for um, vehicles to move just a short distance before um, that 72 hour limit. And, and so they effectively remain in areas for an extended period of time. And, and that enforcement does not address the access, um, if they are just moving, you know, across the street, for example. Um, I can say with respect to the environmental issues, um, that, um, from an anecdotal perspective, the picture that I showed you from Tuesday of this week, that, um, when we identified that, we called environmental compliance and our team and the public works team um, got out there and got it cleaned up. Um, we also had some pictures of a similar um, cleanup that occurred um, from an RV in the materials that we submitted. So, so we do aim to get out there and, and address those. But I think most importantly is that one of the few conditions that we have for participating in a safe parking program is that you do not have a leaking blackwater tank. And so we believe that actually having the safe parking programs in place and having participants in there will actually allow us to monitor that more readily and to address the issue more holistically. So I have a follow-up question on that point. If if participants can't participate, if they have leaky um, black water tanks, which I understand the rationale behind that, but what's the remedy then for that? What is the city providing to help them remedy that solution? Because if they can't enter the, I mean, because the the vehicles in question that are the most problematic are the ones that I understand are the ones that have excessive litter and dumping black water. That's what it comes across in this um, letter. So how is that being addressed? Because of a, a Mercedes Sprinter van is likely not the issue of concern, right? It's these, it's the the ones that have gotten to a point where they're really. Um, damaged and in, in disrepair because of the fact that people don't have the resources to be able to fix their vehicles. And um, under the Coastal Act, we're not supposed to discriminate on who gets access to the coast based on their income. And so since that's the, the, the population of concern, what is being done to help them kind of mitigate those impacts? Sure. Thanks for that question. I think the key thing that's being done is that um, hygiene facilities are being provided as part of the as part of every single safe parking location. And so individuals are not forced to use their um, their in RV or in oversized vehicle um, restroom facilities because they have those restroom facilities available. And uh, you know oftentimes there are opportunities for people to access restrooms during the day, but those opportunities at night are su substantially more limited. I hear that, but I thought you said that one of the participation 
um, requirements was that they don't have leaky systems. That's correct. So if they're not using that system, then it would not be leaking. Okay. So if they enter in with a leaky system, they can still participate so long as they don't use that while they're in the parking lot, or can they not enter if they have a leaky system to begin with? That's where I'm trying to get the clarification on this. We would be able to identify if there's a leak right. by there being um, black water that is leaking. And so if there is no evidence of black water leaking because they're not using it, then they would be able to participate. We're not doing a, a thorough inspection. We're just checking the parking lot to make sure that we're not getting any black water in the parking lot after. I understand your, your point, and I'll just follow up by saying that's, I think the way that come, comes across in the language that we're using is saying that if you have a leaky tank, you can't participate, which means you can't even get into the program to begin with. That's how I interpret that. So maybe I'm misunderstanding, and, and I, but I understand that you are offering um, toilets for people on site. Um, so let's see. I think that mostly, um, I guess the last question I have is that, and this was kind of brought up in the comments, it's more of a comment, but I'll frame it in the form of questions to best of my capacity. But this ordinance really focuses on a demographic of people who actually have more of a capacity to contain their waste and to have rights to privacy and contain their trash because these vehicles are of a size where there's space for that versus people who live in their cars. And my concern is that, um, you know, and I'm not trying to impose any, any other ordinances on any other people, but um, where we might see higher incidents of um, people defecating in public or promoting excessive trash would be people who have a smaller space to live in where they don't have access to a bathroom. And I know that some of the some of what was presented was attributed to this area where there are oversized vehicles, but I wouldn't necessarily say that they're correlated because there are also people who live out of their cars and they need a place to use the bathroom. And one of the things I think you alluded to is that there is no infrastructure down there, even though there is a state park there. And so I'm just curious how um, the city plans on addressing those issues as well. Sure, it's, it's a great question. As um... As Deputy Director Carl mentioned earlier, you know, this is not a, a perfect program. It's not a panacea, um, but we we do see some of those issues, um, particularly with um, access and um, the access concerns with um, the large vehicles taking up multiple spaces and then also accumulation of materials. And so um, this is is aimed at addressing one component. It doesn't address every component. But there are actually additional opportunities, for example, if uh, a, a person who's dwelling in their vehicle wanted to park on street as they would be able to do in proximity to the uh, safe parking locations, they would be able to avail themselves of the resources, both trash and um, hygiene facilities. But, uh, you know, there would not be a mandate and this, this ordinance does not address um, regular sized vehicles, just oversized vehicles. Thank you. Um... I'm going to limit my questions because I know that it's late and I know that there are other people who want to speak. Um, but I do just want to like one, say a few things um, so that aware to the public and to the commission. So I'll just say that um, I've actually worked for four years in this area. Uh, I worked at the long Marine lab from 2015 to 2020. So I'm very much aware of this issue. And I will say that um kind of as what was pointed out in the picture and from my perspective as well when i went down this weekend i counted about 14 to 16 vehicles within that um space that people were talking about between swift and at the end of delaware where the marine lab is in the state park and along a number of the adjacent streets so um, and there weren't many other cars um that were there there was a lot of space for other cars to be parked and so i think about what comes to mind is that when we're thinking about how we're going to decide on this, um, people who either recreate or live in RVs um, should be allowed to also have access to the coast and have access to some of these areas. Um, for those vehicles that are parked for more than 72 hours, I do understand that our role is to try to ensure that everyone has access. So we don't want to have vehicles that decide that that's where they're going to stay and that they're allowed to stay there for months at a time, and which, which can also lead to some of the negative impacts like Black water dumping and gray water dumping, which leads to contamination in the coastal zone. 
I do have some concerns with the fact that the city is um, acknowledging they don't have capacity to deal with that issue, but then they're going to have capacity to run all these programs, which to me suggests that it's a way to push people out of these zones rather than to address the negative impacts that's happening in some of these areas. Um, Santa Cruz is the second most rent expensive rental housing community in the nation and is the fourth most expensive real estate housing market in the world when we look at the ratio of median home price to median household income. So when we think about who has access to the coast in that community is predominantly people who have wealth and means. And as development has been occurring, it is majority market rate and less low income. And so for many of folks who are living in Santa Cruz who are renters, moving into your vehicle is oftentimes one of the only ways that you can continue to survive in that city. And so um, I think we should exercise caution um, when we're moving forward on how these programs are implemented and how we can hold the city accountable. Because to what some members of the public said, um, the city of Santa Cruz has a long history of creating policies that disproportionately and negatively impact residents of the unhoused community or people who live in vehicles. As was pointed out in the staff report, the city did try to stripe, seat, stripe streets to reduce access by RVs and school buses very recently. And the coastal staff um, pointed that out, that they could not do that under the um, coastal development permit that they were referencing. They also did, up until recently, have illegally posted no parking overnight signs in this area. Um, and, um, and those are just a couple examples of some of the things that the, the city has done. And so we should be really cautious in terms of how this is rolled out if we decide to move forward and accept uh, the recommendations today. Um, and then I guess the other thing that I want to point to, which I think is also really important, is that the city is using the environmental justice policy to justify other via other visitors and local residents of Santa Cruz who may have these oversized vehicles from having them in the city limits. So. For example, um, if you are a homeowner and you own one of these vehicles for whether it's work or recreation purposes, you have to pay for permits. And if you're visiting, let's say you're coming from um, another part of the country or central California and you go to visit someone and you have one of these vehicles, you have to pay now to be able to park at your friend's house, for example. We don't impose that on any other visitors who come into the city. If you drive your car into the city and you park it on the street, we don't require people to pay the city for permits to be able to park and visit their friends. Um, and so I think we also need to take into account how the city is approaching the environmental justice policy because it's now another burden on people um, who, and part of our role as well is to uphold the constitution and private property rights. Um, but we're now taking um, someone's property who's owned it within the coastal zone and saying, you can't actually park this here. And actually, that is another question I have for staff because um, I'd like to understand, and I'll give a, I'll give an example. Um, when this was moving forward, there was a woman who does not have a driveway and has a sprinter van that's over 20 feet for her business. Now, under these rules, she can't park it on the street all the time. And so I'm wondering, and even if, you know, it was somebody who just had a vehicle for recreation, what is the city's plans for allowing for those people to park and store their vehicles somewhere that's off street as well? Thanks for that question. I believe I saw that same comment um, of the woman who indicated she owned a duplex and rented the driveway to um, the tenant and so didn't have access there. But anyone who has a oversized vehicle is going to have to um, find an off street location for it. Or um, if they are looking at, um, at uh, a permit, they can do so for limited periods of time. There are, um, give me one moment. Resident permits valid for a year that allow four periods of 72 hours per month. Um, and then out of town visitors have um, permits for 72 hours, and those are allowed at six addresses per year. Um, or excuse me, six per address per year. Um, and if, if you're interested in the, um, the specific cost for those permits, I'm, I'm happy to call up a, a member of the team. No, it's, it's, I think the, the issue there is that um, for people who are trying to access the coast, our role is to reduce barriers. And a big part of what this program is implementing are barriers for people to access the coast. Outside of the unhoused community, 
we're putting more barriers on people who want to access the coast. And so that's a problem. That's something that I think is problematic with, with what's being proposed before us as well. Um, I have, I could, I could go on, but I know it's late. Um, but I will just say that I, I think that there's that I'm really concerned with what's before us. And I think that, um, based on, um, what I was looking at in terms of a lot of the different sections within the coastal act, that there's, likely an opportunity for us to provide direction that would have staff continue either to work with the city. And I would encourage that they're working with actually people who are historically excluded from these conversations um, to bring back something that is mutually agreeable because we did have a planning commission who approved, um, who made recommendations to approve this ordinance that was supported by um, some of the people who are here today. And when that went back to the city council, the planning commission's direction was rejected. And so I think that they're, could be a way forward. Um, I do think it's probably going to likely take some more work. And I'll end my comments there because I know we're um, it's running late. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate uh, you uh, kind of telescoping uh, your questions and your comments. Uh, really appreciate it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Hart. Thanks so much. Um, I have to say that I I really have thought about this, and I know we all have. But what I keep coming back to is, what are the issues before us as coastal commissioners? What are the issues that are before us? There are, there are two issues primarily. The issue of public access and public access for all. And, and the second issue, of course, is impacts on coastal resources and particularly water quality issues. And then there's the environmental justice overlay and what environmental justice is and the way it's defined by the Coastal Commission is the idea, you know, of access, of course, to our proceedings, et cetera. But in this context, I think the most important issue is the environmental justice overlay on access to the coast. I just want to read something um, that was referenced in a report recently um, with reference to that. And it talks about that the California coast is reaching a tipping point of becoming out of reach for many Californians. The research and policy report ref that I'm referencing, which is called Access for All, a New Generation's Challenges on the California Coast, has new results from a statewide voter poll and a series of beach surveys, as well as a new, new analyses of economic barriers of access to the coast. And it, what, it, what it found is that 62% of Californians told uh, responded to the poll that coastal access is a problem um, because of parking, there is they literally cannot access the coast because either parking is too expensive in many Southern California beaches or it's just unavailable. So when I think of environmental justice, I look at, yes, of course, this community, and we'll talk about this community. I'd like to talk about this community in a minute. But I also think about inland Californians of, of all means, but but not wealthy Californians that live on the coast of Santa Cruz and can walk to the beach, but people that live in Watsonville, people that live in Salinas and in other inland communities. And how do they access the coast if coastal towns are um, the streets near the beaches are occupied full time by oversized vehicles where people are living? That to me is a very significant environmental justice issue under the Coastal Act, which is what we're talking about here. So first of all, uh, so let me return to, you know, my agreement with the, uh, with the staff report. The, the issue here is whether people will be allowed to park in oversized vehicles between midnight and 5 a.m. Not whether they will be able to park in oversized vehicles during periods of the day, where people normally access the coast. It's whether or not they uh, can park oversized vehicles basically 24 hours a day. Um, I don't consider that to be, uh, I consider that um, rule that would prohibit parking between midnight and 5 a.m. to be reasonable because it would allow access to the coast for all during the daytime. Um, but of course, we have to look at what is the, what is the city planning the city, to me, it seems like is doing a lot to try to deal with the issue of people that are living in um, oversized vehicles. And we've already talked about that. 
But coming from Sonoma County, where we have, and most of us have these tremendous problems in our communities, I, I, for me, what the city of Santa Cruz is doing is really admirable. And I think as staff has said, this is a one year trial period and things can change. It will get better. But if we don't embark on doing something, if we just continue to discuss rule after rule after rule, to me, access to the coast is going to be extremely limited to all of those people that I just talked about because they really just are blocked from the coast. They have nowhere to park. Um, they have no way to get there. So um, and one of the things I was thinking about in terms of the coastal access issue is whether or not uh, as part of your program, you could include at least a once a day shuttle to the coast from the um, various tiered parking lots. I mean, do you think that's something that the city or could work with your partners to consider? Because I think that that's, you know, it, it once, the oversized vehicles are moved away, it is difficult for them to come back, I would assume, during the day. Thanks for that question, Commissioner Hart. We um, have a summertime trolley program that we operate, um, and um, that is one way that um, individuals can access the coasts, um, and that um, does go through our downtown. We also have public transit bus system that goes through our downtown and uh, provides additional access to the coast. Um, uh, with respect to a, uh, a specific um, separate um, uh, transportation program, uh, we, um, those, those vehicles are not remaining there 24-7, um, um, but for the, the Tier 3, we do have a transportation program where the 24-7 um, program operates that does go um, from that location um, into our downtown and to other key points within the city. But in tier two is a 30 day program. Is that right? That's, that's people correct. Are allowed Over, overnight only. And oh, we're, overnight. so during the day, they could return to the parking spots near the coast. That's correct. Are those free parking spots? Those, and, and predominantly they are, and pr predominantly where they're located, they are free parking spots. Yes. So, how long have you been working on this policy? Um, is it 10 years or? So the, the city had a process okay. um, back in 2016, as was referenced earlier, um, so uh, six or seven years ago, and that was prior to my time with the city. But um, this has been something that um, has been discussed during my tenure with the city, and uh, which is five years, and um, the um, ordinance itself um, was, it's been about two years since the, um, the uh, staff uh, began working with the council subcommittee. Okay. So just to conclude my comments to my fellow commissioners, I think that we need to focus on the Coastal Act issues. We're all concerned about the broader social justice issues. The Coastal Act issues are, does the uh, law as it's being proposed or the CDP as being proposed impact um, public access to the coast? Um, and I think staff has appropriately concluded that public access is in, it would be much more impacted by not having the um, CDP adopted. The other issue is whether or not water quality is being impacted currently under the, the situation, and they've concluded that it is, and that the CDP would result in a significant improvement in natural resource protection. On top of that is the environmental justice issues, which I think I've tried to respond to, that there are larger issues then there's this community, but there's the broader environmental justice communities and access to the coast for those communities. So for those reasons, I think that uh, we should be supporting the city here. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Nothoff, were you signaling that you'd like to make some comments? I just had a question about that because the staff report says that the project doesn't really raise significant coastal act access problems and I you know I the term of um you know I I don't see it as preventing folks from getting to the coast if, just because there's uh, people parked on the street I I find myself to be more concerned about the pollution that's occurring and I don't see why the city shouldn't be taking care of that already and I it it were it concerns me that it seems like we're using parking as a proxy for, you know, the absence of having an integrated um, homeless program. So I'm just, 
I, I, it seems to me that there's, it's, it's not a cohesive whole uh, if you look at the the city. And I just, you know, I, I was so encouraged earlier today when, you know, if you use Pacifica as an example of just kind of keeping at it until folks come together and figure and and include that uh, affected stakeholders, you know, is there a way that we could try and try that one more time to see if we could come to some agreement on this? Because, I mean, certainly, I think um, the pollution issues, the Blackwater very much concern, and certainly directly within our purview. And um, access, yes, but it's not clear to me that folks are actually being prevented from going to the coast. So it kind of reminds me of some of the conversation we had yesterday about limiting parking in some of the commercial areas down south. I, I'd like to see us move away from the deification of parking as an access issue uh, and how there's other ways to get to the coast. But um, so I guess that the access piece doesn't ring true to me at this point that people are actually being um, denied a chance of getting to the coast, either the daily uh, day trippers or um, the overnight folks, because they can come back in the morning. So I, I just, I'm not, I'm not, access isn't ringing true as, as a, a central issue on this one. Um, and the environmental justice and the equity issues do seem pretty stark to me that there's, it's hard to find a path forward to say yes to this one. Uh, but it does seem like we could get closer. And I'd like to see it. Maybe, maybe do we ever do anything for six months instead of a year to see if we can make get something to work? Or is that uh, on something like your this? Head? No. Uh, no, I just think Too given hard. the investment in time and resources, uh, I think you would need at least a year, year. to see, okay. uh, you know, what was working out. Anyway, is that? Yeah. You're good? Okay. Uh, I think, oh, Commissioner Uranga. I was here in 2016 when this issue came up. Very emotional time. People were very passionate about the issue on both, on both sides, but more so on the side to keep people restricted, keep people out, and we denied it at that, at that point. I shut it up, we denied it, or you said it back to staff. I don't recall. Excuse me. <laughs> well, exactly what we did. But here we are, a few years later, I've seen no improvement. I've seen nothing really advancing, more study, more capability, more access for people to look at where to move more than we just don't want you. You're here from midnight to 5 a.m. Go your merry way, come back at sunset, and do the same thing the next day. I don't see any, based on the plan that I've seen presented today, I didn't see any, any improvements. It's a, in fact, in that time, 2016, we had a council member, and I think there's only three of us here, one guy participate, but Bosco and myself witnessed. A city council member be out of it, walk up, yell and scream, and had to be escorted out because she was so out of it that the city council should pass it. And it just was not happening. So that's where I'm at right now. I see no improvement. There's a, there's a, even, even that admission that it's not perfect. That's still more can be done. So let's do it. Let's work on that. And I don't want to disperse anybody, but we have an environmental justice policy in place because that's exactly what we're interested to do is to look at environmental justice issues and put those together with the coastal act and see how they mesh and work together to make improvements to our coast, not independently of each other. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, 
I think I'm the last person and I'm going to try to be uh, extremely brief. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Santa Cruz because my daughter uh, went to, you know, she's a slug. So, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time and she lived over there on Delaware. You know, she was like the last street, right, which then ends at West Cliff Drive. Right. And so uh, I remember, uh, particularly in the, you know, the nice weather, uh, you could not find parking. I mean, you, I remember we would go to Santa Cruz and and just getting into town. It was like a freaking parking lot. And uh and so parking is a major issue in Santa Cruz. I mean, I can speak from experience because I've spent a lot of time there and I spent a lot of time driving around trying to find uh, parking uh, where I wouldn't get a ticket and uh, so forth and so on. Where I'm, And I'm really struggling with this because I feel like there is this really complex social policy that's overlaying this coastal commission inquiry on this program and and here's how i look at it uh, dan as i understand it this ordinance has passed uh outside the coastal zone so if we fail to act there will only be no rules regarding uh oversized vehicles in the coastal zone there would be the same rules that apply today. So you could park wherever the, the 72 hour thing is a real thing. Um, but yeah, it would be the same rules that apply today. And, and is it, as is the, are the elements of the program that you're trying to structure the three tiers, is that available today or that's going to be available based on the adoption of this ordinance? The three tiers are available today. Okay. So, the three tiers are going to stay regardless? We are maintaining the three tiers at this point in time. And if, if we have an approval of the commission, then we intend to continue those. Okay. So that sounds like not sure if the ordinance, if the coastal development permit is denied. That's what I'm hearing. I think it'll be a question for the city to... <laughs> use use somebody else's microphone. Yeah, I was just going to say I think it will. It'll be a question for the city if they want to to continue a program that's only outside. Wait, of wait, the wait, wait a second. Yeah. Start over. I think it will be a question for the city whether they would continue the program if they only could operate it outside of the coastal zone. I think they're looking for a whole program that works citywide. So, I mean, that's a qu question for Lee, but he okay. probably can't even answer that. That's correct. I mean, <laughs> our city council would be making that decision. We have deliberately chosen to not implement it outside of the coastal zone at this point in time. And similarly, um, the continuation of the safe parking programs is. Um, going to be a decision that is left up to the city council. Okay. So, you know, again, another complicated issue. So the thing that I'm struggling with is, um, is that unfortunately there's history, right? With this community where the city may have not acted in the most, uh, I, I don't even, I can't even think of the word cause I'm so tired, but you know, kind of a, let's say, uh, in a more uh, socially conscientious way. Uh, and so I do think that there's a lot of fear and uh, distrust. And so, but also on the other hand, I feel like this is in, that the city is doing more than most other communities who just ticket and say, get out um, to try to address the um, some of the social ramifications of uh, unhoused people living in their vehicles, whether they're oversized, and if if certainly if the cars and, and the other smaller vehicles are able to access those facilities. So, what I'm what I'm trying to really balance in my mind is which is the right strategy to 
have experience about how a program would operate, and then make changes to improve that program. Does it work better to not have a year's experience, or does it work to have a year's uh, experience so that it informs the elements of the program that mo- that need most attention? So, for instance, the issues that um, Commissioner Cummins raised, uh, the issues that some of the other commissioner ra- commissioners raised, to me, in my mind, uh, is it it just seems to me a more efficacious way to approach this because you get 12 months is to inform those decisions and to not end up in a cycle of rehashing issues over and over and over again. Because my feeling is this is going to impact coastal access. Um, I think uh, often of families who are going off on their summer vacation and they want to spend a couple days in Santa Cruz um, and they can't find any parking close to the beach. Uh, So uh, to me, I feel like, yes, the program needs improvement, but I, and I would say, yes, I think that 12 months is a fairly short amount of time to inform that process. And if you were just ticketing, if you weren't providing uh, some wraparound services, then this would be a different conversation for me. But I feel like you're you're trying to provide and inform on some wraparound services, uh, which I think is more of a city policy on these populations, the unhoused, whether they're in vehicles, cars, or on the streets, versus kind of our narrow kind of viewpoint with the Coastal Act. And so for that reason, I'm going to support the staff recommendation. I take into account everything uh, that folks have said, and uh, it's it's these are hard, complicated questions. And so uh, that is kind of where I'm landing. And so is there a motion? Uh, uh, the motion is on page six. I make the motion. Okay. I move the commission approve coastal development permit number A 3 STC 220018 pursuant to the staff recommendation. And I recommend a yes vote. Second. Okay. The motion. We, I'm sorry. Did somebody say well, something? Do we, can we entertain amendments at, the, at this point? Uh, uh, you have we, we could. Do you well, want to? I would like to. Um, do, you, do you want to make an amended motion? Oh, I could. Okay. Well, that way we can get to whatever you want to amend into it. Okay. I would like to make an amended. Okay. Motion. Please tell us. My first what? One. Um, as just, just a second. Sorry. You should make an amending motion because we need to figure out how the commission is going to vote on the amending motion to know whether it will be folded into the main motion. That's yes. On the that, floor. I, yeah. Okay. So I would like to make an amending motion, motion to uh, require the city to uh, put together a stakeholder group, uh, an outreach to the affected community during the year as part of the, uh, to inform how this works. So to, I'd like to include okay. that in the um, approval. Okay. Now, do we have to take a vote on the amending motion first, even if the maker of the motion is happy to include that? Yes. Okay. That's, that, that was my understanding. And, and okay. needs a second. Okay. All right. So um, I'll second. It. All right. So uh, Commissioner Nodhoff has made an amending motion that would require uh, an establishment of a stakeholder group to all the affected communities uh, that would need to report back before the end of that year. Yes, and to specifically include members of the unhoused community. Correct. Okay. So with all that, Miss Warren is typing. So let's just take a breath, everybody. I, I know. I know. I, I'm just trying to manage here. Okay. Commissioner Wilson, did you have a comment? Or no, it was a, que- it was a question related to the amending motion. Tangentially, the, <laughs> well, well, it it does it it, it it it's 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 fundamental to this because it has to do with the year time period. So, 
if if this commission votes yes, this still comes back to us in a year to do it all over again. Is that is that what I'm really understanding here? No. Um, no? Okay. If this commission votes yes and approves a coastal permit as it's currently structured in the staff recommendation, that coastal permit expires in a year. Expires. And the city would need to do a new coastal permit. Um, it's entirely likely that that new coastal permit will get appealed back to the commission, so you might see it again. Um, but this permit would expire in a year. Okay. And just one question for staff. Or for, or for Mr. Butler. Yeah. In relation to, and I just have to put this because because the Commissioner Cummings brought this up, in relation to non-operable vehicles, how do you deal with non-operable vehicles in this context? So um, in conversations, thanks for that question, Commissioner Wilson. Um, in conversations with our parking programs manager, um, she has um, indicated that their team generally will um, look to accommodate those individuals. They may, for example, get a ticket if they have um, if they are there. There's an appeals process for those tickets. Um, the ordinance does have a um, a specific exemption for a broken down vehicle. It's for a limited period of time for 24 hours. Um, and um, then if they do get that ticket, then um, that's when our um, appeals process would kick in. It's first um, done at the, um, the staff level, and then they can appeal that decision to a, um, a independent uh, mediator. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wilson. Okay, so uh, the, uh, we have an amended motion uh, with a stakeholder process uh on the table the makers of the motion are asking for an i vote this we're going to do two roll call votes technically we need the city to react to the amending motions so oh okay um, so we just need to know yes he doesn't have to agree to we just need to have them react to it uh, please a uh, brief reaction no problem with the admitted motion. The one issue with the one year is that it's going to take us several months to implement, then to get a coastal permit through our process and including the appeal process. That's okay. It's going to be. Yeah, we understand, but, but your coastal permit will be good for a year from us, but you do your process and <laughs> things have a way of working out. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, okay. All right. Okay, uh, <laughs> Commissioner Cummins. I have a um, a question around process. So, because I also have maybe a couple amendments that maybe would be considerable by the board. So after we vote on this, if I wanted to add additional amendments, would I make another motion to amend? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So on the first amending motion, uh, the makers of the motion are asking for an I vote. Uh, Ms. Miller, please call the roll. Commissioner Escalante? Yes. Escalante, yes. Commissioner Harmon? Yes. Harmon, yes. Commissioner Hart? Yes. Hart, yes. Commissioner Nuttall? Yes. Nuttall, yes. Commissioner Rice? Yes. Rice, yes. Commissioner Uranga? Nay. Uranga, no. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Wilson, yes. Commissioner Aguirre? Yes. Aguirre, yes. Commissioner Bachko? Yes. Bachko, yes. Commissioner Cummings? Yes. Cummings, yes. Chair Brownsey? Aye. Brownsey, yes. The vote is 10-1. Okay. Uh, the amending motion is adopted. Uh, Commissioner Cummins, did you have uh, uh, a, an, an additional amendment, amending motion? Yes. And um, you know, I think that um, what I'm really trying to get to with this is kind of based around equity and um, some of the environmental justice prov provisions. Um, because um, I think that, you know, people should be required to have to get some kind of notification about, you know, whether they're going to get towed or if they want to participate, because maybe people don't want to participate. So um, and I, as I brought up earlier about people who um, may own these vehicles and um, may not have driveways and they live, they're residents of Santa Cruz. I think that there's also impacts on them that should be taken into consideration because, there are people in Santa Cruz who are renters 
um, who are cramming very uh, crowded spaces, and sometimes they use they have these vehicles and they don't have anywhere to park. Okay, what would you like to to, to um, suggest? So my suggestion uh, would be that um, prior to any tow, that vehicles are provided seventy two hour notification. Okay. Um, the next would be that um, oversized vehicles owned by visitors of individuals who reside in permanent housing structures in the coastal area are exempt and are subject to the 72-hour vehicle abandonment law. And the last would be oversized vehicles owned by individuals who reside in permanent housing structures in the coastal zone and the vehicles registered at that address are exempt and subject to the 72-hour vehicle abandonment law. Oh, okay, we, none of us know what you're talking about yeah. on that one. Okay, sure. let me just say, we 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 get the notification, the 72 hour notification. Okay, but what's the uh, what what what's what's population you're trying to address in those last two? The last two is that um, part of this uh, ordinance is that um, if you are a homeowner, yeah, or if you're a renter, yes, and you own one of these vehicles, yes, that you have to pay permit fees, and you and they're not. Okay, so you would, you, but why are you saying that they would? Oh, you're saying they would be exempt from the seventy-two hour, uh, seventy-two hour uh, abandonment. They, they'd be exempt from the ordinance. From the ordinance, because we already have rules on the books that say you can't park your car in one spot for more than seventy-two hours. Oh, I hours. gotcha. Okay, um, Mr. Butler. So basically, what he's saying is that they would not have to do a permit, but they still would be subject yes. to the seventy-two hour rule which is currently on your books. Yep. They would just be exempt. Is it, aren't you saying they would just be exempt? They would be able to park their vehicles on the street and park. No, that they would they would be they would not have to pay the permit fees, but they would be subject to the same laws that everybody else is. Cuz right now if you have a car, yeah, if you have an RV, if you park your car in front of your house for more than 72 hours, you're subject to tow by via the abandonment law. And so this is more equitable because it applies to everybody equally. Right. We got it. What would uh, I, I believe that's that's uh, I would say that seems like it's it's treating the, the house community and the unhoused community differently. And um, I think the implementation of that would be challenging in terms of how uh, an officer would understand if that vehicle belonged to someone who lived in a residence or rented versus not. Can I can I suggest a change? Uh, to your change, uh, what I would suggest is why don't we do the 72-hour notice for abandonment and then refer that other issue, because that's really complex, to to uh, the stakeholder group, okay? Because then that way it gets dressed, uh, and then you, you can have time to finesse it rather than us doing it here from the dais uh, when we're kind of blind yep. with exhaustion. Yeah. Um, so, so, council, I need to ask you, do we need to add the prior amending mo uh, prior amendment, or is, do we have amending motion number one, amending motion number two? This is amending motion number two. And the way I understand... It doesn't nullify amending motion number one. Correct. It just okay. gets added on top of okay. it. And so the way you've just framed it, amending motion number two would be that to, prior to any tow, vehicles are provided 72-hour notification. In addition, um, the stakeholder group would be required to consider whether visitors um, who have oversized vehicles, visitor, visitors of residents, could get um, it could be exempt from this, and um, residents who have oversized vehicles would be exempt from the um, this requirement, but that is only for the stakeholder group to consider. It's for the stakeholder. Yes, the stakeholder group to consider. Okay. I would second the amending motion for the 72 hour notice and then just be directing the city around the stakeholder group to consider the other issue, just not to complicate that. Amendment. Right. So is that an accurate representation of your motion? It's been changed, but as, now, as now it is. Yes, I'll accept. It. I'll accept the changes for now. Okay. However, I do. There was also one other oh, thing that I wanted to say. Third amending motion. I was. I was going to include it with this. I was trying to get all of it. So the reason why I suggest yeah. that is because some people might agree to this, but not the last thing. So we okay. try to keep amending motions to just one issue in case commissioners disagree. I've wrapped in the whole stakeholder thing because it doesn't seem that controversial. Okay. All right. Let's do that, uh, commissioner. So all right. Uh, does it, the we're going to call the roll on the uh, second amending motion? The makers of the motion are asking for an I vote.
Ms. Miller. Commissioner Harmon. Yes. Harmon, yes. Commissioner Hart. Yes. Hart, yes. Commissioner Nuttoff. Aye. Nuttoff, yes. Commissioner Rice. Yes. Rice, yes. Commissioner Uranga. No. Nay. <laughs> or, or no way. Okay. Uranga, no. Commissioner Wilson. Yes. Wilson, yes. Commissioner Aguirre. Yes. Aguirre, yes. Commissioner Bachko. Yes. Bachko, yes. Commissioner Cummings. Aye. Cummings, yes. Commissioner Escalante. Yes. Escalante, yes. Chair Brownsey. Aye. Brownsey, yes. The vote is 10 1. Okay. The amending motion number two is adopted. Okay. Um, motion number three, as briefly as you can. Sure. Um, I know that this, I know the city is supposed to work with staff on outreach and signage plans. And I would like to add an amendment. They should come up with an operations and management plan. And within that plan, um, they outline enforcement and management protocols to address illegal black water and gray water dumping and the litter accumulation in the coastal zone. I would second that. Oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, uh, the city, uh, can you respond to uh, that uh, amending motion? Uh, specifically related to um, operations and management to address illegal dumping and um, uh, litter, um, we can, uh, that's that's fine. We, okay. we have those procedures in place and we can inform the staff uh, about that. Okay. All right. So the, the city is uh, supporting. I the, don't understand. Uh, basically. The, basically. So can I'll just summarize this again. Um, so you've asked the city, you've asked the city to come up with an operations and management plan. And when the, within that, they must outline their plan for enforcement to address illegal black water dumping and litter. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Okay. So thank you, thank you uh, council. All right. So the, uh, it's been moved by uh, Commissioner Cummings. Is it seconded? Uh, uh, yeah. oh, of course you did. Okay. So um, Commissioner Cummings and uh, Commissioner Aguirre are asking for, and I vote on amending motion number three. Ms. Uh, Miller, please call the roll. Commissioner Hart. Yes. Hart, yes. Commissioner Nuttall. Aye. Nuttall, yes. Commissioner Rice. Yes. Rice, yes. Commissioner Uranga. My comment before I vote. Is that if that motion were included the original, I would be okay with it, but I'm not. Oh, oh, okay. That's all right. So you're a no. Got it. Thank right you. On. Thank you. Aranka, no. Commissioner Wilson. Yes. Wilson, yes. Commissioner Aguirre. Aguirre, yes. Aguirre, yes. Commissioner Pachko. Reluctantly, yes. Pachko, yes. Commissioner Cummings. Yes. Cummings, yes. Commissioner Escalante. Yes. Escalante, yes. Commissioner Harmon. Yes. Harmon, yes. Chair Brownsey. Aye. Brownsey, yes. The vote is 10 1. Okay, so we are now going to return the amending motion number three has been approved. So we are now going to return to the main motion as amended by amendments number one, number two, and number three. The makers of the motion are asking for an I vote. Ms. Miller, please call the roll. Commissioner Nara. Aye. Nara, yes. Commissioner Rice. Yes. Rice, yes. Commissioner Uranga. Be consistent. No. <laughs> Uranga, no. Commissioner Wilson. Yes. Wilson, yes. Commissioner Aguirre. Yes. Aguirre, yes. Commissioner Bajko. Yes. Bajko, yes. Commissioner Cummings. Reluctantly, yes. Cummings, yes. Commissioner Escalante. Yes. Escalante, yes. Commissioner Harmon. No. Harmon, no. 
Commissioner Hart. Yes. Hart, yes. Chair Brownsey. Aye. Brownsey, yes. The vote is nine to. The uh, uh, permit is approved uh, by the commission. I want to thank everybody for your hard work and attention, uh, despite the delirium that occurs after 7 p.m. And so uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Cummings, for your attention to the details and uh, to, to everybody. Okay. Go with good thoughts and 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 we'll probably see you back here. Uh, See everybody tomorrow morning. Thank you.